DiscerningHearts.com, in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, presents A Sister of St. Therese, Servant of God, Leone Martin, Bearer of Hope, with Father Timothy Gallagher. Father Gallagher is a member of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, a religious community dedicated to retreats and spiritual direction, according to the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. He is featured on several series found on the Eternal Word television network. He's also the author of numerous books on the spiritual teachings of St. Ignatius of Loyola and the Venerable Bruno Lanteri, founder of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, as well as other works focused on aspects of the spiritual life. A Sister of St. Therese, Servant of God, Leone Martin, Bearer of Hope, with Father Timothy Gallagher. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. I'm just delighted that we're able to have this conversation about Leonie, learning more about her, especially through the eyes of her mother in our previous conversations has just been uh, such a delight. What a blessing for letters. It is such a blessing to be able to see Leonie through the eyes of the one who knew her best in these first 14 years of her life and who is herself a saint, obviously. Speaking of saints, let's interject just two places at this point in the story of a soul where St. Therese speaks of Leonie. So we'll stay with the chronology, but still in terms of these first years in Leonie's life, there are two points where Therese speaks of Leonie. So this is early on in the first part of the story of a soul where she uh, speaks of her oldest two sisters, Marie and Pauline, and then turns to Leonie. Dear little Leonie held a warm place in my heart. She was very fond of me, and in the evenings when the family took a walk, she used to take care of me. I still seem to hear those beautiful lullabies she used to sing to get me to sleep. She was always trying to find ways of pleasing me, and I would be sorry if I caused her any trouble. I remember very well her first communion, and especially the moment when she picked me up in her arms. Therese was about maybe two and a half at this point and carried me into the rectory. It seemed so nice to be carried by a big sister, all in white, like myself. Well, that's pure Therese, you know, just just the goodness. But in her own way, she's reflecting the warmth and the affection, what Leonie's aunt called her heart of gold. That's reflected there. And then the second moment is this well-known point when Therese says, I take them all. And let's read it as she describes it, and then a little commentary on it. One day, Leonie, thinking she was too big to be playing any longer with dolls, came to us with a basket filled with dresses and pretty pieces for making others. Her doll was resting on top. So the image that you have there, as Therese describes it, is of a fairly large basket, and it's filled with dresses for dolls and cloth out of which other dresses could be made with Leonie's own doll resting on top. So it, it's presented as a pretty attractive set of items. And so Leonie says, here my little sisters choose. I'm giving you all of this. Celine stretched out her hand and took a little ball of wool with, that pleased her. After a moment's reflection, I stretched out mine saying, I choose all. And I took the basket without further ceremony. Those who witnessed the scene saw nothing wrong and even Celine herself didn't dream of complaining. Besides, she had all sorts of toys. Her godfather gave her lots of presents, and Louise, that's the maid, will be saying more about her, found ways of getting her everything she desired. So that's the incident, and now Therese comments on it. This little incident of my childhood is a summary of my whole life. Now that's pure Therese. Uh, she can take the smallest things and see the, the greatest messages in them. Later on, when perfection was set before me, I understood that to become a saint, one had to suffer much, seek out always the most perfect thing to do, and forget self. I understood, too, there were many degrees of perfection, and each soul was free to respond to the advances of our Lord to do little or much for him. In a word, to choose among the sacrifices he was asking. Then, as in the days of my childhood, I cried out, My God, I choose all. I don't want to be a saint by halves. I'm not afraid to suffer for you. I fear only one thing, to keep my own will. So take it, for I choose all that you will. Now, 
In the first biography of Leonie, which was written by a Franciscan priest, a Father Stefan Joseph Piaspel, P-I-A-T, who was really the first historian of the Martin family and has written a number of books on various members of the family and the family as a whole, and who is maybe almost the best writer and historian and commentator on the Martin family. There are other fine writers, but he'll always have a certain primacy as the first and and one who knew the sources very well. Now, when he comments on how we understand this little scene, he points out that the reality was much different than what we might think. We have the image of of a large basket filled with very attractive pieces. But in truth, he says, it was a very small little container, maybe the size of a person's hand. The little scraps of cloth in it were really of no use to anyone, no value to anyone. So that when Leonie holds this first to Celine and says, take what you want, Celine takes the one thing that she can get any use out of, and that's this little ball of wool. And then when Leonie turns to Therese, now you have this poor little container of unusable scraps of cloth. And Therese, even at this early age, with this exquisite charity that is within in her, in order to spare Leonie any pain, very warmly says, I want everything in it. So that says an awful lot about Therese, but it's also a further indication of Leonie as we've been seeing. There's a good heart in her, but it's clumsy. She's not able to read the situations. She can create these embarrassing situations for others. And in this case, Therese responds with an exquisite charity, charity that is so typical of her throughout her life. So it's just another window into the life of Leonie at this early time. Well, let's return then to the letters of St. Celie as she speaks about Leonie. So at this point, Leonie, just picking up where we were before, Leonie is 11 years old. She has just failed her attempt to live as a boarder in the school. And so Celie writes, I'm very satisfied with my two oldest daughters. And on the other hand, I'm deeply saddened to see Leonie as she is. Sometimes I have hope, but often I lose heart. And this is Celie, who who loves her daughter so much. However, my sister, that's the visitation nun, Elise, told me that she's convinced that Leonie will become a saint. She's going to take lessons in the afternoon at the home of two elderly women, formerly nuns. Now, She's back home. Uh, She needs to continue her schooling. She's impossible to keep in a classroom setting. She just disrupts everything. She doesn't learn. She's just too difficult to handle. So Zeli, casting about, learns of these two elderly women who she understands were formerly nuns and teachers as nuns and who are willing to teach Leonie. It seems like an ideal solution. So two elderly women, formerly nuns, who taught in the past and can cope better. I'm happy to have found them, but it's painful to have to go there because she'd be much better off with her sisters if she could have stayed at the boarding school with her aunt and her two older sisters. All right, this next letter is again to her sister-in-law. And this is in December. As every year, Zeli is enjoining upon her sister-in-law not to do too much for the New Year's gifts that she gives each year to the children. So she goes through the various children and comes to Leonie. As for Leonie, I won't ask you for any toys because she doesn't play with them anymore. She works on her studies. You could give her a rosary for her first communion, which she'll make on the Feast of the Holy Trinity. And that was always special to Leonie throughout her life, the remembrance of her first communion on that feast. She knows her catechism perfectly. So this is one area where Leonie seemed to have engaged enough to have learned. She knows her catechism perfectly and answers the questions better than I would have believed. If she didn't become flustered, she would be one of the first in her class. So any kind of examination or anything in front of the others, just emotionally, she would get too flustered and she would show up rather in mediocre way. Last Tuesday, I took her on a pilgrimage to the Church of the Immaculate Conception in Sayez. That's that shrine of Our Lady that we mentioned earlier. When in the first months of her life, it looked like Leonie might well not survive, mentioned that her father walked on foot in pilgrimage to that shrine, asking for the grace of her healing. 
So her mother takes her there to help prepare for her First Communion to obtain the grace to make a good First Holy Communion. All right, this next letter is again to her sister-in-law, and it's the next year. Leonie is 12 at this point. I'm having so many problems with my poor Leonie, pauvre Leonie. You know that every day she was taking lessons in the home of two elderly retired nuns, which seemed like a good solution. I wasn't dissatisfied with the way they were teaching her, And then, all of a sudden, I discovered something about these so-called good sisters that absolutely prevents me from continuing to entrust Leonie to them. So here is another attempt, which through no fault of Zelie goes very badly. She had understood that these were nuns, and the truth of it turns out to be very different. Zelie discovers this not immediately because of anything Leonie says, but because she becomes aware of an eight-year-old girl whom these two supposedly former nuns have taken in out of charity, who is being supported by the charitable organizations in the city. And she discovers that they're not even feeding her properly. The poor child is starving. And this begins to open a whole can of worms. I began to learn of this story two months ago. Before acting, I wanted to be very sure of what I suspected because it would cost me a great deal to denounce them. But last Thursday, an event made up my mind completely. There's a big uproar here that I won't begin to tell you, but which has already caused me and will still cause me a great deal of concern and a lot of aggravation. As we'll see, she will describe these two weeks as the worst two weeks of her life. I was able to obtain a place at the refuge. So this is a place run by sisters where they'll take in a little girl like this. And I'm waiting for her mother, so she'll take her there. I told the sisters, the whole, supposed sisters, the whole truth of what I thought of them. These unfortunate hypocrites who pray or pretend to pray to God from morning till night. And I took Leonie away from them. A very lengthy letter where she goes through all the details on this. The little girl was being beaten. The supposed nuns were making her do their work for them. Uh, they were practically starving her and threatened her that if she told anyone, she would suffer for it. And it's Zelie who, once she discovers this, is just, she's adamant. She simply is not going to allow this to go on. When she writes back to the pastor of the parish where the family lives, and the pastor informs the mother, the pastor tells Zelie that these two women were never nuns at all, that in fact he had to expel them from his parish, and they simply pretended to be nuns to really prey on others. So poor Leonie, you know, gets involved in all of this when her mother thought that she had found a solution. When the the mother of this little girl comes to take her little girl away from these two, I'm going to call them women, they cry out that uh, the little girl is being kidnapped. People come and they believe them, take the girl away from the mother, the police get involved, and a whole, uh, just a very difficult situation takes place. But the police do a good job on this and come to the truth of it and things resolve. But it's a very painful and difficult time for Zelie. So this is just one more thing in Leonie's life that she has to deal with and go through as her mother is doing the best that she can to find the best way to raise this child. Wow, Father Gallagher, this is something that mothers and fathers are experiencing even today. I know that with both of our children who are on the autism spectrum. We've had similar experiences, believe it or not. One of the most egregious was when our son, after graduating his school programs, got involved in an adult program. And it all seemed so lovely on the surface. And we were just so excited that maybe this is something that he can do and there is a place for him. And we put him in the program and it turned out that they were not doing everything that they had promised. As a matter of fact, they were actually committing a fraud in the billing for which they were charging the state. It turned out it was our son's caseworker who went in to just check on some normal things that found there were all these discrepancies. And it ended up in a complete shutdown of this program. And it was not nice and it was an ugly experience. I mean, it's just heartbreaking. I mean, there are so many parents who have had their kids in situations. They're hoping that this is going to be the answer. Maybe this is the place that they can find help. You love your child 
so much. You want the best for them and you want to find a place for them. And it's just so frustrating because you begin to trust people and then the trust gets broken. Then you don't know what to do next. You just want your child to be safe and you just don't know what to do. There are many people who have a a beautiful desire to help those who are challenged or who are considered handicapped, but it only takes one or two to totally destroy that hope and almost feel like it crushes the spirit. There are many out there, I can tell you right now, who can relate to this roller coaster that Zelie and Louis are on with Leonie. The blessing, in a way, is that for Leonie, if she hadn't been there, that other girl would have stayed in that situation. I think Sally became a saint, not because she was Therese's mother, but because she was Leonie's mother. Well, interesting. It's, uh, it's not only Leonie's story, but at this phase, it's St. Zelie's story as well. In the same year, a little bit later, a letter to, again, her sister-in-law. So this is in 1875. It's a jubilee year in the church. The Pope has declared a jubilee. And Celie writes, Leonie earned her jubilee indulgence and received absolution. She was afraid of not being prepared well enough, and this attitude pleased me. I hope God in his mercy answers my prayer for this child, who is one of my biggest concerns. Okay, two months later, me writing again to her sister-in-law. I'm more pleased with Leonie. She does what she can to do well. She gives the correct answers when we question her and knows her catechism perfectly. Every day she tells us that she's going to become a poor Claire. Now, Zelie was very attached to the convent of the poor Claires in Alençon. She went regularly there to pray. She eventually became a third order Franciscan inscribed there. So there was a deep bond, and she would take Leonie there at times to pray with her, which is how Leonie gets to know this convent of poor Claire's who are going to come back at a future point into her own story. Uh, Every day she tells us that she's going to become a poor Claire, and I have as much confidence in this as if it were little Therese saying it. Therese is two years old. I just read my brother-in-law's letter to her. I took her aside, and I, who never cried, dissolved into tears interesting to know what her brother had said to Leonie. I don't even want to try to guess, but he could be very firm. It's quite likely that he would have said something rather firm to her. She seems very determined to correct her faults. All right, this next letter is again to her sister-in-law two months later, and Leonie is still 12 years. Last week, I received a letter from my sister in Le Mans, that's her, the nun, telling me that my brother really wants Leonie to go to Lisieux. So it's a train ride, I'm going to guess, maybe about an hour and a half, a couple hours. And periodically there would be visits between the two families. And Leonie has not yet been to Lisieux. And she's resisting. And at this point, Celie doesn't understand why. It wasn't difficult for me to decide because I find in all fairness that she should go there. And without her resistance, she would have gone a long time ago. Finally, I told her my decision, and she came to terms with it willingly. Now she's looking forward to it very much and talks of nothing else. So that's all, I, all you hear around the house. She asks me how many weeks until her sisters will arrive, and she says these weeks aren't getting shorter. She's never been to Lisieux, and she's happy to go there. Okay, a week later, again to her sister-in-law. We hear about nothing else but Lisieux from morning till night. Even the baby, that's Therese, is joining in and wants to go to Lisieux to see Celine's godmother and little Jean, too. Leonie said to her, I'll bring you all the cake they give me, my little darling. I'm not going to eat one of them. So that's always there in Leonie. You know, with all of her troubles and outbursts and the undisciplined character, that good heart, that's kind of the paradox that's always there. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. That's a constant thread in her. And so her mother comments, she truly has a heart of gold. That's the same phrase that uh, Zelie's sister, uh, the nun, had used, and now Zelie uses it herself. She truly has a heart of gold, my poor Leonie. So there it is, heart of gold, my poor Leonie. And she particularly loves her little sister. 
So one of the reasons she refused to go to your house was that if she went, Celine wouldn't go. So Celine now understands why Leonie's been resisting going, because she understood that if she went, Celine, who very much wanted to go, would not be able to go. So it was really a heart of gold there. There was a generous impulse on the part of Leonie at this point, which Zelie now understands. All right, this next is a year later, and this is Zelie writing to Pauline. From this point on, we'll have a lot of letters of Zelie to Pauline, who was still at the boarding school at, in Le Mans. Marie, the oldest, had finished her studies and was back home, and she was actually taking over the education of Leonie at this point, and Celine as well. And so Pauline is the one daughter who is away at the boarding school. Celie writes regularly to her, but something develops as she does. There's a kind of a bond and understanding between mother and daughter. Pauline almost becomes a kind of confidant for Celie. I'm not dissatisfied with my Leonie. If we could manage to triumph over her stubbornness and make her more cooperative, we could make her a good girl, devoted and not afraid of difficulty. She has a will of iron, and when she wants something, she overcomes every obstacle to get what she wants. Her aunt had already mentioned this in a letter that we read earlier, and this will be another key trait that's going to see Leonie through many struggles Repeated failure, failure after failure after failure, and she simply will not give up. When that quality, the will of iron, that when she wants something, no obstacle will turn her aside. Once that gets turned toward God, toward grace, toward saying yes to the Lord, then there really is a space there for God to work in a very rich way. But she's not at all devout. She prays to God only when she can't do otherwise, and the faith of her daughters meant everything to the parents, and obviously to Zelie, so that this is hard for her to see this. This afternoon, I made her come by my side and read some prayers. But soon she'd had enough and said to me, Mama, tell me the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. I wasn't sure I wanted to tell the story because it tires me out a lot. This woman who has a a flourishing business and five children and a household and who gets exhausted because it tires me out a lot and I always have a sore throat. Finally, I made the effort, and I told her the life of our Lord. When I arrived at the Passion, she was overcome with tears. It made me happy to see her have these feelings. Zelie, at this point, probably is in the beginnings of her breast cancer, correct? I mean, we're getting close to that time, aren't we? Oh, very much so, yeah. Yeah, so that can play very much in the fatigue and the, a lot of what, what's going on here too, correct? Oh, I'm quite confident of that. Celie and Therese had this in common, that they simply spent their humanity without limits until the moment of their death. Both of them are similar in this. They just gave every last ounce of energy that they had without thought of self, without looking for mitigations. You know, these letters that we're reading, we need to remember that she's had full days with the children and her business. As I mentioned, at times she could have up to 30 women. These were part-time, the women who would have their own families and so on, but would give some hours every week to create this lace that was so famous and that Zelie knew how to do so well that she was very much in demand. In fact, it's one thing we can say that the Leonie learned to sew very well. And there are things that she sewed still conserved in, that you can look at. You can find pictures of them online. It's just some remarkable needlework. But to write these letters, her mother would need to begin when the children were in bed and the day was done. Sometimes she'll mention that she's just spent two hours writing. One night she finishes at 10.30 after four hours of writing at the end of a day. So these letters themselves, reaching out to stay in touch with her children and family members, were often written at the cost of some fatigue and some self-sacrifice. So this is to Pauline. Leonie is now 13. I must take Leonie to the catechism class on perseverance. So the custom was they would make their first communion, and then a year later they would have a second solemn communion, and that's probably what's at play here. This is the last time because her second solemn communion, so that is what's taking place here, will take place on Sunday, May 21st, which is a week later. As always, Leonie is looking forward to being all in white. Up till now, the material side strikes her more than the spiritual. 
Yet she hears the other world spoken of so much that she herself speaks of it often, but this only touches her lightly. Oh well, let's hope in God's mercy toward this child. In some respects, I have many consolations. I'm very happy with Marie, and her ideas please me. This is the opposite of Leonie. So Leonie is a source of worry for her, and the other daughters are a source of consolation. Five months later to Pauline. I believe that Celine, younger than Leonie, will give me many consolations. She has an angelic nature. She's already seriously thinking about what she'll have to do to make her first communion. You know, it strikes me as I'm reading these, that this is how ordinary all of this is. This is a mother raising her daughters, raising her children, and concerned about how they're responding to this or their studies or their catechism. It's, it's very much like the life of any family. God is very good to grant me compensations which diminish the bitterness my poor Leonie causes me. That's a strong word, the bitterness, mm-hmm. the suffering, the heartache. I can't get through to her anymore. Now, uh, Leonie is 13 at this point, and there's a mystery now. For some reason, Zeli, who is so loving and whose family members love her to death, her husband and her daughter's, and who reaches out with the same love to this daughter, Leonie, finds herself repulsed, and, and she cannot understand what's going on here, that there's some kind of a mystery that is unraveled. I can't get through to her. She does only what she wants and as she wants. She just noticed that I was writing and said to me, Mama, don't say anything to my aunt about me. I'll never do it again. So she's obviously acted out in some way. Celie is writing to Pauline, who is at the boarding school, where the aunt is as well, and quite likely that whatever is is written to Pauline will be shared with the aunt. And so Leonie, who has such esteem for her aunt, uh, just doesn't want her to hear about whatever way she's acted out. I didn't answer her, but she started again so as to prevent me from writing. To have peace, I said no. And now watch what Celie says here. I'm not lying because it's not to her aunt I'm saying it, but to you. That is to Pauline. Oh, well, here is everyday life, which isn't cheerful, I assure you. But often to console myself, I think of my dear Pauline, who makes my consolation. It's a bomb to my wound, and I find myself happy. Marie also makes me happy. Later in the same letter, here's Leonie coming downstairs to bring me my rosary and who's saying to me, do you love me, Mama? I won't disobey you anymore. You can hear the pathos in that. Sometimes she has good moments and good resolutions, but they don't last. Now, this next letter is written in, well, precisely January 8th, 1877. And this is about five weeks before Celie's sister will die. She had very poor health, and it was evident that she was weakening for months. They'd known it. They knew that she wasn't going to last too much longer. And... In this letter, Zeli is recounting to her sister-in-law what proved to be her last visit with her sister in the convent at Le Mans. And at this point in the letter, Leonie comes up. Here are the messages that I gave my sister for heaven. I told her, the moment you're in heaven, so as soon as you get there, go and find the Blessed Mother and tell her, my good mother, you played a joke on my sister by giving her poor Leonie. She's not a child like the one she asked you for, and you must fix this. I'll interject into this that Leonie herself was so aware of how different she was from the others that at one point she became really worried, and she was afraid that she had been exchanged as a child at birth, that she really wasn't a daughter in this family. And her mother had to reassure her that, uh, no, that was not the case. All right, so say to the Blessed Mother, you really played a joke on my sister by giving her poor Leonie, and you have to fix this. Then go and find Blessed Margaret Mary. So that's now St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, as we know her today. In response to the novena made by her aunt, well, as Zeli always firmly believed, as a result of that novena, Leonie survived those first difficult 16 months. So go and find Blessed Margaret Mary and tell her, why did you miraculously cure her? It would have been much better to let her die Mm. on by conscience to repair this misfortune. If she's going to turn out this way, why did you spare her? 
So you too, like Our Lady, you have a responsibility to repair this. Mm. So uh, she tells her sister-in-law that her aunt didn't really think this was the way you speak to Our Lady and to a saint. She scolded me for talking like this, but Zaylee stands her ground. But I didn't have any bad intention, and God knows this very well. She sounds like a mom who is at her wit's end. She is very much. And you're dealing with, and I can speak to this probably a little bit more personally than guys could. This is a time in a young girl's life where hormonally there can be some great fluxes. I'm going to try to say this as delicately as I can. But as women, we're very aware that our moods will swing given the particular time of the month it is. And that could have played a part if she's already dealing with certain issues, whether if they were indeed physical, if she was a possibly, and I say again, possibly on a spectrum, such as autism, but then you throw in the natural course of a young woman's body that could play a lot. And as the mother of two women myself, that gets to be a very challenging time of life. Do you think I said that delicately enough? Yes. <laughs> and, um, and you're absolutely the right person to bring that into the conversation. It's helpful. It just fills out the picture in another way. Yeah. There's all kinds of dynamics you can see being played a mother that loves her so much, but is at the wit's end. It's that one who just, ah, oh, what more can I do? And then on top of that, physically, on top of all the other stresses of life, she's dealing with an underlying illness that she may not be fully aware of yet. Oh, at this, at this point, uh, Zelie is utterly aware. I, mean, I haven't okay. gone into these details because we're telling Leonie's story, but the diagnosis is clear. She's very afraid she may not have much more time to live. And in fact, she will die later in this same year. So at this point, since we've raised it, we're in January. She will die in August of this same year when uh, Leonie is 14. This 14th year in Leonie's life is really the pivotal year, as we'll see as this unfolds. Not that all the struggles would be over at this point, but this was the decisive year in her life. So this next letter is written 10 days after the preceding. It's written on January 18th of this year, 1877. And just about five weeks later, on February 24th, Sister Marie Docite, Leonie's aunt, will die, actually. So Leonie is well aware that these are the final days of her aunt, and she wants to write a letter to her before she dies. Yesterday, she said to Marie, I'm going to write to my aunt in Le Mans before she dies and give her my messages for heaven. I want her to ask God to give me a religious vocation. So there it is, uh, very strongly, early on here. Marie pretended to make fun of her to see what she would say. Marie is, is really interesting. Sometimes she intuits things that nobody else sees, but other times uh, she misses what's happening. And in this case, um, now, I don't want to be too hard on her here. Nobody knew how to make any sense out of Leonie, and she was always doing things that were just kind of foolish or didn't make sense. So Marie simply presumes that this is another little will-o'-the-wisp or something that's floated into her mind. Marie pretended to make fun of her to see what she would say, but she persisted and said, everybody can make fun of me, I don't care, but I want to tell her this before she dies. Finally, today, she wrote her letter all by herself without saying a word to her, without anyone saying a word to her to give her any ideas. This is what she wrote. So this would be referred by others, the only other letter of Leonie that we have before the age of 19. My dear aunt, I still treasure the picture you gave me. I look at it every day to become obedient. That's the big struggle because she's so undisciplined and self-willed and will not fit into any structure at school or at home. That will be a big issue for her throughout her life. I look at it every day to become obedient like you told me to. Marie framed it for me. My dear aunt, when you're in heaven, please ask God to give me the grace of converting me and also to give me the vocation of becoming a true religious. That word true will come back. 
because I think of it every day. I beg you, don't forget my little message, because I'm sure that God will answer your prayer. Goodbye, my dear aunt. I kiss you with all my heart, your very loving niece. So Zeli asks of her sister-in-law, what do you think of this? As for me, I'm very surprised. But where did she get these ideas? It certainly wasn't me who put these ideas in her head. I'm quite convinced that without a miracle, Leonie could never enter community life. So she's well aware of this. You know, the structure and the order of even cloistered religious life like the visitation, how is the undisciplined Leonie ever possibly going to live this? It's her future that worries me the most. I say to myself, what will become of her if I'm no longer here? So she's well aware that she may not live that much longer. I don't dare think about it. But I assure you that this little letter renews my courage, and I find myself hoping that perhaps God has merciful plans for this child. And the next sentence is just remarkable. If it only took the sacrifice of my life for her to become a saint, I would give it willingly. If it only took the sacrifice of my life for her to become a saint, I would give it willingly. Uh, she's really a model of motherhood, it seems to me, you know, as I read about her. Yeah. Wow. And she writes that knowing that uh, she may be giving her life before too much longer. All right. She goes and she describes the same incident three days later in a letter to Pauline this time. Let's see, I would have liked a few words from your aunt for Leonie. There's quite a story behind this. Last Wednesday, while Marie was giving the class, Leonie said in a very serious tone of voice, I want to write to my aunt before she dies and give her my messages for heaven. Marie, very surprised, asked her what it was about. She told her that she wanted to be a religious, and her aunt would have to obtain this grace for her. Marie made fun of her, but she persisted, and Thursday morning she wrote her note, which I think is rather good for her. I said to Marie that evening, there's one thing that surprises me. It's that she wrote a true religious. Marie, also surprised, said, I really wanted her to erase the word true. I pointed out to her that it didn't mean anything, but she stood firm saying, please let me put it in. I want it to be that way. The next day, Marie asked her, what does that mean, true religious? Leonie answered, it means that I want to be a completely good religious and in the end become a saint. Now let's note these two things that Leonie, who has this will of iron and who will not give up, the two things that she really wants. She wants to be not only a religious, a nun, but a completely good religious, and she wants to become a saint. I don't know what I should think of all of this because the poor child is covered in faults like a blanket. We don't know how to handle her. And this is what you've been uh, pointing out, Chris. And it's this mystery that there's something unaccounted for here. There's some piece in the equation that nobody can understand. Zeli will say this in, in a letter that trying to take care of this child and manage this child is so difficult that even doctors, literally, she says, would lose their Latin trying to do this, that he's, even the wisest would, would, would have no answer to it. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to handle her, but God is so merciful that I've always had hope, and I still hope. You've been listening to A Sister of St. Therese, Servant of God, Leone Martin, Bearer of Hope, with Father Timothy Gallagher. To hear and or to download this episode, Along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com or you can find it on the Discerning Hearts free app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for A Sister of St. Therese, Servant of God, Leonie Martin, Bearer of Hope, with Father Timothy Gallagher. <laughs>